OK, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first Sunday back together, live. Exciting. It's really good to be here, and uh, a very warm welcome to you. This is the second of our morning bubble services, and uh, it's great that you've been able to find your way here this morning. And uh, a very warm welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream. If everyone... Oh, no, they won't be able to see you, will they, Ben? If everyone turns around... It will make absolutely no difference. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome to the live stream, and uh, great to uh, great to have you. Whether you're a member um, who's uh, who's not not coming back yet, uh, or whether you're a visitor who's joining us, you're really welcome, and trust that you enjoy the service with us this morning. And uh, it's great to have um, some visitors with us uh, today. Um, Prina and um, what was your name again? Perrine and Perrine, it's great to have you and uh, welcome to you. And just moved from Harrow, new to the area, it's great to have you here. And uh, good to see, good to see. And we've got the lockdown champions, Muklan and Yung Chow, in our presence here today. And uh, the victors of the lockdown challenge. So we're, we're, we're blessed uh, to have uh, such magnitude of talent in our, in our midst today. Um, so welcome, welcome to you all. Um, I know that uh, things are not quite as we would like them yet. There are still some frustrations about meeting together like this and uh, not singing and so forth, but we should praise the Lord um, that we are able to meet, uh, to gather together, not to be separate, but to gather together as the people of God under the word of God and uh, just thankful to him that we've got this premises because uh, there are many churches up and down the country who don't have their own premises and are still struggling, but the Lord has graciously given us this and we can use it to meet together and that's a real, real encouragement. So uh, let's begin with some words from scripture and a prayer. This is Psalm 29 and uh, a few verses from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Let's bow our heads and begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the king of all the world and we thank you that you are enthroned in the highest place. We thank you that your glory is great and that your word is powerful. We thank you that you are enthroned as king forever and ever and ever. And Lord, we thank you that you give strength to your people and that we know that strength because of your grace to us. We thank you that you bless your people with peace and we thank you that because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his shed blood, because of his resurrection glory, because of the gift of faith, we have peace with you in him. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather this morning and uh, to listen to your words and to enjoy being together. We thank you for our children uh, who we can uh, even hear and will hear throughout the service in the back rooms who are back together enjoying interaction enjoying games together, and most of all, listening to the truth of your word. We pray that you would bless our kids this morning. We thank you very much for their leaders uh, who are going to be teaching them. We thank you for the stewards who are here, who've been cleaning and setting up and making sure that we can, uh, making sure that we can do this as safely as we can. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, PA and the uh, technology, and just ask you that that would work well for those who are joining us remotely. And uh, we pray that most of all, despite the distractions of these strange days, uh, that we would be enabled to focus upon you and your glory and your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, there's just a couple of notices to run through. And uh, when, it, when it comes to our services here in, in the hub, um, the, the aim with the leading in the stewarding uh, is is not to be is not to be kind of draconian and heavy-handed and uh, to in, to enforce lots of uh, rules really, but uh, we we do we do have a responsibility to keep things running safely and a responsibility to one another uh, to make sure that we're as safe as we can be. And so I'm sure I'm sure everyone will do this anyway, and it certainly happened in the first service. Um, but do please work with the stewards. 
um, who, are, who are working as hard as they can to make this as safe and as smooth as possible and to then get the room ready for other services. So uh, do encourage them by, by looking out for them and uh, listening to them when they're uh, giving us instructions and stuff. That would just be really, really helpful. Um, please do observe the distancing measures that you'll all be familiar with in everyday life now and that we're trying to put in place here. Um, once we've started the service, uh, it's, it's less of an issue, obviously, because we're all, we're all sat down. But when we're moving through the building into the toilets and around the corridors and areas where there's potential pinch points and just in the immediate vicinity of the building, um, just, just, just be wary of distancing and crowds forming and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, the toilets are available. Uh, the aim with all our services is to, is to make them a little bit shorter. And so you, you hopefully will be able to hold it uh, and not have to use the toilet. But if you do need to go, then that's fine. And uh, the toilets are in the, in the foyer there for us. Um, and uh, you will have seen perhaps already on the doors the signs. We're trying to run a one-out, one-in kind of system, which, again, you, you, might, be, uh, you might be used to. Um, alongside the Bible tots in the uh, pink room and the kids work here in the back hall, uh, there is a self-service creche, uh, which is in Pete's office. Uh, so he's uh, lent, lent his office for the use of the creche. And uh, that's just up the stairs and it's the first door on the left. And there's some toys and space in there. So if you've got uh, a very little one with you and you need to make use of that, then, uh, then please, please do. Um, just to say again, these are, these are you know, frustrating things and uh, it's stra- that there's lots that's strange it is very strange preaching through this um, perspex uh, plastic here and seeing a room full of masks and things aren't back necessarily to how we would like them but but th- for now this is, this is part of trying to love each other as best as we can in this building and uh, and so you know um, or let's let's try to help one another do that as, as best as best we can uh, a couple of other notices. Uh, we've got the Tales of the Unexpected course, session number two, which will be on Tuesday evening at eight o'clock. Um, we had a really encouraging time, actually, with the first one this week. And uh, because the stories are, are each, each session is a different story that Jesus told, um, then you can, you can, if you've got friends who would be interested in coming on, um, just let us know and we can send them the link and make sure they book on through Church Suite. And um, it's a way of trying to use technology as best we can to share the good news of Jesus. So if you've got anyone who might be interested, uh, do, uh, do encourage them to, to, um, to make contact with us and we can make sure they can uh, get, those, get those details. Uh, on Wednesday night, we've got home group, but you'll, uh, you'll be aware now that we've finished the summer series that we were doing in, uh, in self-control. And we're moving back to home groups on Zoom for now. And the idea is that whereas before we might have met on separate evenings, we're actually all going to meet together now on the Wednesday evening. And we're going to begin with some teaching. So one of the staff or the elders will do some teaching. And uh, then after that, we're going to break into our home groups. And then your home group session will run as it normally has been on Zoom. So there'll be an opportunity to discuss what we were all learning together and then to pray for one another. Um, But we won't then come back together. So it will be all together for some teaching and then break out to, um, to pray and discuss. That will be Wednesday. Again, details will be, will be, in, the, will be in the email for that. Um, the plan is this evening, we've got two services. Uh, there's the 5 o'clock and the 6.30, and the 6.30 will also be live-streamed. So if you're still going to be at home, then uh, do come back at 6.30. Uh, not the 5 o'clock time that we used to have for our recordings, but 6.30 for the live-stream. And uh, Ben Reed uh, is going to be preaching to us from, from Luke and taking those services. So uh, it would be great to join in, join in for that. Okay, we're going, to, uh, we're going to stand and we're going to watch... Uh, one of our songs together and uh, we thought rather than stay seated we would make it just that little bit more interactive and to stand and to listen to the songs and um, just because we can't um, sing at the moment it doesn't mean we have to um, just be passive you know when the songs are being played Um, and it might be worth thinking about a few of the lines and turning them into prayers as you as you're looking at the lyrics and praying them for yourself and for your church family and uh, there, are, there are all kinds of other ways we can try to, you know, mentally and physically engage with the sung worship, even though we can't actually sing. So the first song we're going to sing is To God Be the Glory. And that is the heart cry of every Christian, isn't it? To God Be the Glory. So let's stand and uh, watch that together.
had to make reference to that in the first service, but I just love that, that loving gaze, you know, that Ben and Kerry enjoy at the end of the song, you know, sort of that intense looking into each other's eyes, and uh, it has been wonderful, hasn't it? I'm sure all of us would, would agree, and I'm very thankful to the music team uh, for the hard work they've put in over lockdown, recording all these songs to enable us to praise God uh, from, from where we've been. So let's bow our heads and, uh, and give thanks. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that uh, you have done very great things for us. We thank you that you have uh, looked with favour and kindness upon us, uh, that even though we have treated you terribly and that we have dragged your name through the dirt and that we have been uh, hurtful and cruel to other people, uh, that, Lord, you have not treated us as our sins deserve, um, but that you sent your Son to make a full and perfect atonement for us. And now we know that through faith we can say, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. We thank you for that greatest of all things you have done for us in the gospel. And Lord, we thank you for our music team and for the way they have been uh, thinking about and recording uh, songs for us over lockdown to keep praising you. And uh, we just thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, please have a seat.
Um, I was speaking to, uh, to Rory Bell before the service, who's running our kids' work, and I was asking him what the children are going to be learning. Um, I have foolishly in the past made, mis- made the mistake of telling the kids what they're going to be learning whilst they're sat in front of me, and then it somewhat takes the punch out of the lesson uh, when they then go through to teach it. But we don't have that problem now, because uh, they're not in here. And uh, he told me that they're going to be learning that God destroys his enemies, uh, which I thought was a great first lesson uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our kids. He's going to be doing a whole overview of the book of Exodus, uh, which is quite a, quite a challenge. And, uh, but that's what they've been learning, uh, I think, in lockdown. So, um, you know, praise the Lord that our children are, are learning from God's word together again. We, in these morning series uh, services, are going to be starting a new series in 1 Kings. And uh, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, or the reading will come up on the screen in just a moment, we're going to be focusing on the life and the times and the ministry of Elijah. And uh, this particular section of the Old Testament is just full of wonderful stories. It is an exciting read, this part of 1 Kings. Um, But as I hope we're going to see, these are more than just good stories. These are stories that are very helpful for us in the age in which we we live. Because as we're going to discover, Elijah lived at a time of great turmoil and uncertainty. Um, Politically and spiritually and even physically, these were dark, dark, dark days. It was an unsettling time, particularly if you were a follower of Yahweh. But into that, we are going to see that the living covenant God, Yahweh, is going to show over and over again that he is the true God and that unlike Baal, his word runs the world. He is going to prove himself to be that God. And so although in our country, Baal worship and a lack of rain are not particularly common, we are going to see that things are not that different We are a nation in turmoil. We live in unsettling days, both physically. We're going through a physical hardship at the moment, aren't we, as a nation? This year has has been a physical hardship for many people. We are a nation that is given over to idolatry. We have chosen to push the living God and his word to one side and have thought we know better than him. And therefore, we are a nation that need to be called back to the true worship of the true God by by his people. And so we're going to see, actually, although this is many hundreds, thousands of years ago, there is a lot that is the same. These are dark days of turmoil, and yet our Lord lives, and he has promised to care for his people in this time. And to start with, before we begin the Elijah section in chapter 17 of 1 Kings. We're going to actually go back to 1 Kings 16 and we're going to read from verse 23 because if we're going to fully appreciate Elijah's ministry, we need to understand the air that he was breathing. As I've said, they were dark days, but it's not until you get into chapter 16 that you realise just how toxic and polluted the spiritual atmosphere was. And we'll see that together in our reading. So let's let's read from verse 23 of 1 Kings 16. It will be on the screen, or if you've bought your own Bible, uh, then follow along there, there too. In the 31st year of King Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel, and he reigned 12 years, six of them in Terzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shamar, For two talents of silver and built a city on the hill calling it Samaria after Shema, the name of the former owner of that hill. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and he sinned more than all those before him. He followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit so that they aroused the anger of the Lord the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. As for the other events of Omri's reign, what he did and the things that he achieved, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Israel? Omri rested with his ancestors and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son succeeded him as king. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, 
Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, and he did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Galilee, in Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. This is the word of the Lord that we are going to be looking at together. Um, but first of all, we are going to stand and we're going to watch another song. And we're going to look at the words, all praise to him, which, which really is a, a very succinct summary of this section of the One King story. All praise goes to Yahweh, the true God, all praise to him. So as we stand, uh, let's even use this song as a way of preparing our hearts to see uh, the truths in God's word. Let's stand together.
And we thank you that you are Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your life-giving word, uh, the word which created this universe, the word which sustains it, the word that gives new life to lost sinners, and the word which instructs us and encourages us and rebukes us and corrects us and trains us that we might be thoroughly equipped to live lives that are pleasing to you. We thank you for the privilege of being together again and sitting under your life-giving word, and we pray Holy Spirit, that you would do all that you have promised to do with your word in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do have a seat, and uh, if you would like to um, turn back to 1 Kings 16 and 17, and um, as I mentioned in the introduction, in order to uh, appreciate uh, Elijah and his ministry, we do need to spend time thinking about the climate into which he was called. And uh, the first point uh, this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope those who are watching online can, uh, can, see, can see it as well, is uh, the landscape dark days. The landscape dark days. And that was the point of turning to 1 Kings 16, just to find out how polluted the air is with idolatry. See, if you take someone like Omri, the year is about 850 BC, and uh, Omri is, is a significant king. I mean, for hundreds of years after he died, Israel was referred to by some as the house of Omri. In other words, he left a legacy and the people was defined by his legacy. And when it came to politics and international trade, he was a successful man. If you've been following the news this week, you will have seen lots of information about international trade deals and securing free trade agreements and deals. And it's become a very important thing for us to do, hasn't it? To secure good relations with other nations. Well, if Omri was alive, we would do well to have him on our negotiating team. Uh, he was good at that. Uh, he wanted to be friends with the king of the Sidonians. And uh, at this time, the best way to unite kingdoms was through marriage. And so Ahab, his son, and Jezebel uh, got married in order to cement that political and perhaps military relationship. So he was a success on the international stage. He was also quite prudent and wise when it came to geography. And uh, we're told that he moved the capital of Israel to Samaria, which was obviously a good decision because uh, Samaria then became a shorthand way of describing the northern kingdom. So that was a successful building project. He, uh, he moved the capital to Samaria. So as I say, he, he, he was an achiever. Uh, if you were to walk through a, uh, a graveyard and to see Omri, uh, I'm sure his relatives would have put various successes uh, upon, his, upon his gravestone. But basically, the writer of One Kings isn't really interested in those achievements. As far as he's concerned, Omri was a king who bought a hill and did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He committed evil. He was morally bankrupt. He departed from the word of the Lord. And that's what we need to know about him. And the same is true of many of the kings in this book. They may get uh, one or two sentences or a paragraph perhaps. But basically, if they despise the law of the Lord, then nothing else matters. The author of this book has a standard and he knows his Old Testament and he knows the book of Deuteronomy particularly and for him that forms the backdrop of this book. How do you know whether a king is successful? Well let's evaluate him by how closely he sticks to Deuteronomy and the law of God. That's how the kings are being evaluated. And actually, there are particular verses in Deuteronomy which, uh, which he may have in mind. So, um, again, hopefully, if you're watching, and you'll be able to see these, these words. If not, this is from Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. When you have driven them out, the nations, and settled in their land, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do the nations serve their gods? We will do the same. No, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. Because in worshipping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. And within that same book, there were even regulations about the king and what he was to do. When a king, this is Deuteronomy 17, when a king takes the throne of his kingdom, 
He is to write for himself on a scroll, a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law. I mean, what, what an amazing country it would be if both our royal family and our politicians obeyed that. Imagine if when they were enthroned or appointed, their first job was to crack open the law of God and with pen and ink to write it out and then to read it every day and to make sure that them and their organisations were following the law of the Lord. You can imagine it would make the House of Commons quite a different place to be, wouldn't it? If the first part of the day was devoted to the reading and discussion about the law and then you would move to today's business. That would be an amazing country, wouldn't it? Well, that is what the kings of Israel were expected to do. And if they didn't do that stuff, if they didn't hate idols and revere the word of the Lord, then whatever else they achieved, well, nothing really matters. They might get a line or two, but if they don't do that, then they're failures. But then we meet Ahab. And we know straight away that something is going to be different about Ahab because unlike the other kings, he doesn't just get a few paragraphs. He is going to rear his ugly head for the next six chapters of this book. And that is because, we'll discover this together, that is because his commitment to idol worship, his personal involvement with Baal worship, his departure from Yahweh, the one true God, is so complete and so shocking that he is given all of this material as if to say we have now reached a new low as a nation. This now is a kind of total apostasy. And when Jezebel comes onto the stage, things are only going to get worse. I mean, Jezebel, I was thinking this week, Jezebel would not fit in very well in our society where we're expected to be very tolerant of other people's opinions, uh, where even people of faith are encouraged not to emphasise differences, but to focus on similarities and work together for the good of the nation. Jezebel would, would be very unwelcome in those circles. Uh, she wanted Yahweh and his name and his prophets to be eradicated from the land. And so, I think what is happening here in 1 Kings is a bit like what happens in Revelation and other parts of the New Testament, where the, an the Antichrist comes. Ahab and Jezebel are a type of Old Testament Antichrist who, who, who summarise everything that is opposed to Yahweh and, uh, and his purposes. And so I'm afraid if you were alive during this time and you were one of the remaining remnant who loved the Lord... The atmosphere and the air that you're breathing is just toxic, toxic air. These are, these are dark, dark days. And that is the landscape we find ourselves in in this series. So the first point then is about the landscape. The second point is about the prophet. The prophet Elijah the Tishbite. That's the second point. I'm sure you've seen uh, those, those chat shows where... Um, where the host is getting ready to introduce the next guest. And uh, before the next guest comes onto the stage, the, uh, the host really wants to work the crowd and to get them fired up so that the, the guest has a proper welcome. And they, they, sometimes they really lay it on thick, don't they? So you might have, my next guest is the award-winning author of 11 books, a woman who single-handedly has reshaped the genre. A Nobel Prize winner loved the world over. From humble origins, her rise to fame has been meteoric. Will you please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for... And the point is there's, there's backstory to enable you to appreciate who is coming onto the stage. But then, then you come to Elijah in chapter 17, who by all accounts is a fairly significant character in the Bible, and yet there is nothing by way of introduction. Not really. He walks onto the stage. In fact, someone, someone in the first service actually said to me, you know, when I read that in verse 17, I thought, I was, I was flicking back and I was thinking, now we must have met Elijah before in this book because it, felt, it feels like we should already know who he is kind of thing. But no, the introduction is so, is so brief, isn't it? There's nothing about his prior life. 
no reference to his tribe. Is he a, is he a, is he a, uh, you know, a big wig or is he a, 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 someone of lower social status? Is he a priest or a governor? The only thing we know is the place of birth, and even that was insignificant. But we know the thing that matters most to this author. He is a servant of the living God. He stands in the presence of the living God to do his will. And according to our author, that is all that really matters. His name is Elijah, which literally means my name, my, my God is Yah, which is a short way of saying my God is Yahweh. And so what a scene. Just when the whole world seems to be given over to idolatry, my God is Yah, steps onto the scene. I am a spokesman of the living God. He comes like a lightning bolt in the dark. He illuminates the horizon. The prophet of Yahweh has come into this idolatrous smog. My God is Yahweh. The prophet arrives, Elijah the Tishbite. So there's the landscape, there's the prophet, and thirdly now, let's look at the confrontation in chapter 17. Yahweh lives. Verse 1, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Maybe you remember those very early days of lockdown um, when, uh, when suddenly the products that we had been relying upon for, for years just suddenly disappeared from our shelves. You might remember Milk Day, you know, when, when there was a day when you just couldn't get milk for some reason. You know, everywhere you went, there was no milk. And I had Laura, who's here, ringing me up. Tom, you need to find some milk. I can't find milk. I've been to the big Tesco. Even the one in New Malden has got no milk. You know, um, it's huge. If they're out of milk, everyone must be out of milk. Um, can you please try and find some on your way home? And then we went on this scrabble to find the milk. And all that we could find was the one with the red lid. And who drinks that? I mean, <laughs> nobody. That was all that was left. And so we got the red lid milk, and that was all that we could have. And then there was toilet roll crisis. And then even things like Marmite, you know, began to disappear for a while. And these kind of, uh, these things that we'd become so used to were disappearing from our shelves. But, but, but think now of a community which relied 100% on the land, which needed the rain in order to function in every way. This is a devastating judgment for them. You know, you couldn't just import some tomatoes from South America, yeah, or, or fly in some lamb from New Zealand. You know, those, those options weren't available. If the rains failed year after year after year after year, your land would turn to dust, your crops would all dry up and perish, your barns would be empty. This is, this is a tough judgment. And the point of it is to show, in a very tangible way, that God hates idolatry and he will hold his kings and his people to account if they embrace idols. And so when Elijah says this to Ahab, again, the Old Testament law is the backdrop. If the people and the kings anger the Lord, he would turn their reign to dust. And the truth is, God would not be God if he didn't act on his word. This is a judgment that has come upon them. But this is about more than judgment. In Canaanite religion, it's very important to, to know that Baal was the god of the rains. He was the god of fertility. If your land prospered, he was pleased with you. If it didn't and the rains failed, he was angry with you. He was a very tempting god to worship for that reason, because he was seen to be the god of the rains. And so when Elijah says there will be neither rain nor dew except by my word, he is throwing down the gauntlet here. He is saying to Ahab and to the people, we are going to find out who the living God is. Let's find out who sends the rain. Let's find out who makes the crops grow. Let's find out who rules the world. If it is Baal, 
then he's going to have no problem overriding me. In fact, it will be embarrassing, won't it? Because I've just made this big statement and he can just send the reins this evening and you will see what a fraud I am. But if there is no rain, then let everyone know that Yahweh is the living God. So this is not just a fun trick with the weather. And it's not a David Blaine stunt. I don't know if you saw him disappearing off into the heavens with all his helium balloons, his latest weather stunt. This is not, this is not a trick. It's not sleight of hand. And it's more than just judgment. The very existence of Yahweh is tied to this word. As surely as the Lord lives, there will be neither rain nor dew except at my word. So this is what it all hangs on. In chapter 16, we meet the king of the Sidonians, and his name is F. Baal, and that literally means Baal lives. Chapter 17, Elijah comes, and he says, as surely as Yahweh lives. This is about which God lives. Who is the living God? It is an unmistakable challenge. And the rest of this series is really going to follow that pattern. In fact, when we come to Mount Carmel which we will do in a few weeks, is very interesting because on Mount Carmel, it's the God who answers by fire. He is God. But here it's the God who answers by rain. He is God. So this is all about the existence of the true God. So that's the challenge. Yahweh lives. And then the, the, the fourth point, final point, is this, the Lord. The Lord who provides for his people. Have a look with me at verse uh, 2. And uh, there, there it is again, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So this is a very kind of interesting twist in the story because Elijah appears in chapter 17 and he storms the royal palace and proclaims a message to, Yah, uh, to, uh, to Ahab. But then just as soon as he's come onto the stage, He's then told to withdraw and to go and hide himself in this ravine and to wait for the Lord's provision. And it is quite a strange command, isn't it? You can imagine Elijah thinking, OK, Lord, so you want me to go and hide in the ravine and drink from the brook? Well, that makes sense um, because that's where water is. But then I've got to wait for this ancient delivery service to come and feed me. These, uh, these ravens, you know, I don't know if he was able to order through Just Eat exactly what meat he wanted, you know, whether he wanted chicken in the morning or steak in the evening. Um, but he had to wait for these delivery driver ravens to come with his uh, provisions. And uh, it's, it's peculiar. There, there is actually a Jewish tradition about this uh, where, they, where they believe that the ravens would take the meat from Ahab's banquet table. And uh, that morning and evening, the ravens would, would, would break in through the windows and take from his food and bring it to provide for his prophet. Which I, I love the idea of these ravens pillaging his banquet table every day. Um, don't know whether that's true, obviously. Um, but, uh, but it's a strange thing, isn't it? You've got ravens, which were unclean birds. They were unclean birds. And uh, next week, we're going to see the Lord using a Gentile widow to support the prophet. So there's strange things going on here. And the Lord is wanting to, to show us just how barren Israel has become. But with these promises, he's also wanting to stretch Elijah's faith. You see, Elijah is going to speak for the Lord, but that won't be much good unless he himself trusts the word of the Lord. He's got to rely on God's word. He's got to trust in God's miraculous provision because otherwise he's not going to be able to speak properly for the Lord. So this is a way of stretching Elijah and growing his faith. And of course, as we can see in verse 5, uh, that is exactly how Elijah responds. So he did what the Lord had told him. Ahab disobeyed. Elijah did what the Lord had told him. And so we're supposed to see the contrast here between the nation, which is, like a, which is like a desert, and Elijah, who is like an oasis in the desert. There is a kind of spiritual famine everywhere, but Elijah is able to enjoy the Lord's provision. He is an oasis in the middle of the desert. He lives according to the word of God. He trusts the word of God. And crucially, 
He is a picture of what Israel ought to be. In Elijah, we see the true Israel at this stage, obeying and trusting the word of the Lord. So, as we begin to think then about applications, before we, before we begin to kind of apply this story to, to ourselves, which it has lots to say to, um, let us see how, how this story points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it does so in some amazing ways, doesn't it? You see, you think of the Lord Jesus' arrival onto the world stage. In many ways, he also came from nowhere, didn't he? People said, is this Joseph's son? Uh, can, can anything good come from Nazareth? Are not, are not these his brothers and sisters? Do we not know this man? Who is this man? This is the man of humble origins who we know. The prophet Isaiah says that he had no beauty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. There wasn't, in one sense, this great pedigree behind him. And yet when Jesus Christ steps onto the world stage, he is the river of life in the desert, he is the light in the darkness, and he proclaims, my father lives. And I have come to tell you about his kingdom. Or think of the way Jesus obeys the will of the father. Right at the beginning of his ministry, when he's out in the wilderness, and he's experiencing his own drought, isn't he? He's in the desert being tempted by Satan, and yet the Father takes care of him. The words of Scripture were his food. The angels came to minister to him in the desert place. The Spirit enabled him to succeed where we have failed. Jesus, in that scene, is the true picture of what Israel and the people of God should always have been the perfect obedient ones and yet the shock of the Christ story is that that same son went to the place of cursing for you and me it's interesting that Elijah is spared from that isn't it he doesn't suffer the same judgment as Ahab he is taken away and provided for but Christ as part of his obedience went to the place of cursing for you and for me. If you're familiar with Matthew's gospel, you might remember when Jesus is on the cross and Jesus is crying out from the cross, what do people say about Elijah? Do you remember? They say, he's calling Elijah. Leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to rescue him. But Elijah doesn't come to rescue him. Because Christ's hour had come. This was the moment of salvation where he would give his life for us. Taking our idolatry upon himself. So that we could be brought into relationship with this same living God. Jesus is the humble hero of this story. Which Elijah is anticipating in his words and in his life. This one who obeyed and trusted the Father for us. And with that in mind... We as God's people can take great courage at the moment. You see, I don't need to tell any of you really that we, we live in dark days, don't we? There is loads of rain in England, but spiritually we are a dry, we are a dry people. I don't know if you've been looking at this over, over lockdown, if you've been following what's going on, but in, in almost every subject, the Lord and his word is altogether sidelined how are we going to manage this country what should we teach our children about who they are how are we going to navigate this crisis together how should we think about identity and social justice issues how do we help people with their physical and mental health in this crisis in in every subject the lord is totally sidelined totally out of the picture and we look for wisdom and guidance and life in all the wrong places. And sadly, even as Christians who do know better, we can fall into that idolatrous way of living. And part of what 1 Kings is telling us is that if you are living in dark days, things might be about to get worse. You see, spiritually, we might be living under an Omri at the moment with an Ahab just around the corner. 
There is no guarantee that things will just get better and better and better. There is no promise that we are at the lowest we could be, and from here the only way is up. We may be an Omri expecting an Ahab. These are dark days. And yet, we have this great promise from God. Firstly, he is going to take care of his own name. Isn't that just wonderful? A wonderful assurance. God is going to take care of his own name. He'll make sure that the living name endures. Here's a great quote that I picked out from, uh, from one book. To see Elijah appear so suddenly reminds us that we need not despair when we see great moments of evil achieving spectacular success on this earth. For we may be sure that God in unexpected places has already secretly prepared his counter movement. Therefore, the situation is never hopeless where God is concerned. Whenever evil flourishes, it is always a superficial flourish. For at the height of the triumph of evil, God will be there, ready with his man and his movement and his plans to ensure that his own cause will never fail. The Lord will take care of his own name. He will build his church. The idols will come and go, but his name remains forever. Doesn't that give us great confidence in dark days? That God is going to look after the glory of his own name. But secondly, God is going to take care of us. As he did for Elijah and as he did for Jesus, he is going to take care of those who are in Jesus. A great promise that you might know from uh, the Sermon on the Mount, given to disciples living around pagans, just as was in Elijah's day. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, as we prioritise the glory of God's name, he will take care of us. We know it because he's already taken care of our greatest need in Jesus. The living bread and the living water has come to us. And if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up freely for us, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Of course he will. He will take care of us. And so with those two promises there is a final application that we find in, in the book of James. So this is from James chapter 5 and verse 17. It's fascinating the way Elijah is used here. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And here's a bit of a spoiler. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, that is very interesting because in 1 Kings, we don't get that side of the story. Here we learn that Elijah didn't just say there will be no rain. He prayed earnestly that there would be no rain. In other words, he wasn't just a mouthpiece who was talking the talk but not walking the walk. He wasn't just spouting things. He prayed in accordance with the promises of God. And through his prayers, he turned a nation on its head. But here's the thing. If you're sat there thinking, well, I understand that. Elijah was a great man of faith. He prayed and the rain stopped. I'd love that power. Um, you know, uh, this is a man of faith. How could we be like him? James says, no, no. He was a human being just like us. Wow. Wow. He was a human being just like us. Same God, same dark days, same sinful nature, but he prayed and the Lord moved. And so although we don't have the same control over the rains, although we would like that, particularly when holiday comes around, this was a, this was a special work of God. The point is when we pray in line with God's promises, he really can do extraordinary things for his own glory. Really, really can, on a national scale. You see, how is it that the dry 
desert in which we live is going to flow with the living water of the gospel, it's going to be as we, as we pray. As we pray. As we pray, Lord, hallowed be your name. Lord, would you cause your living name to be honoured in this nation. As we pray that the worthless idols would be seen for what they are and that Jesus Christ would be lifted high in our land and that many would come to know him. As we pray like that, God says, Elijah was a person like you. He prayed in line with my word and you too can pray in confidence that I will take care of you and take care of my own name. This, is, this series, whenever we look at Elijah, the New Testament would have us say, remember he's like you. So pray like him. And so let's bow our heads together now and pray. We have a great God who's going to take care of his name, take care of his people, and therefore we can pray. Just take a moment, perhaps, whether you're at home or whether you are here, to, uh, just to reflect on some of those things that we've learnt and to, uh, and to pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you that you are the living God and that you live and that you reign forever and that your name and your glory and your promises will prevail. We thank you, Lord, that even though the idols of our day seem and in some senses are so powerful, that in the end they are just vanities. They are vapor and mist. They are passing and dying, whereas you are the true God and you live forever. And we thank you, Lord, for your commitment to your own glory, that you will ensure that your church is built and that your uh, lost ones are gathered in and that you will, you will fulfill all your good promises. Not one of your promises will fail. And we thank you, Lord, that just as you looked after Elijah and Jesus in the wilderness, you will look after us, that you will provide for us, that you will take care of us, that even where there are brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering greatly, that you will take care of them. You have promised to build your church and to bless your people. And Father, we pray that with these promises in our hearts that we would be people of prayer. Uh, Lord, there is something so wrong with us when we teach these things and we believe these things, but we don't pray these things. And so, Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith and help us to pray and trust you to glorify your son in our country. Father, we pray for brothers and sisters in Belarus still. And uh, even though uh, the news perhaps will be starting to forget all that has gone on there, we, we know that you are still with your people and you are concerned that justice prevails in the land. And uh, Lord, we pray for Taras and the church and uh, for some close ones who have been arrested and imprisoned. Uh, Lord, we, we, we thank you that you are committed to your own name in Belarus that you are committed to building your church and that you have promised to care for your people. And we pray that our brothers and sisters might know these realities at the moment. We pray for um, uh, the university here and for the students who are coming down to halls. And uh, we thank you for an opportunity to welcome some of them to the services. And uh, we pray, Lord, as they come to university and uh, get involved with student life and culture, with all its temptations and difficulties, that, Lord, the Christians who are coming here would be committed to the glory of your name, that they would look to stand and to speak for you as Elijah did and that they would trust you. We pray that those who are searching for a church would, would find a home with us, that we would be able to disciple them and care for them even in these times. We pray, Father, for our children and young people who've gone back to school. Again, after uh, a time in lockdown, going back into school with many joys, but also with fresh temptations and with lies being taught to them about you. We pray, Lord, that they would hold fast to the promises they learn in this place and would trust you as the living God. We pray, Father, for those in the church who uh, can't be with us today, 
And uh, we ask you that you would bless them and that uh, your word would have been an encouragement to them today. And uh, we pray for those who are struggling, maybe with all kinds of physical or uh, mental health complications. And uh, we pray that in their own dark days, uh, they would know your provision and would love your name. We pray for um, uh, a couple, John and Anya, in the church, uh, particularly Anya, who uh, waters broke this week, uh, almost 10 weeks weeks early. And uh, we we thank you, Lord, that all seems to be well with Anya and uh, their baby girl. And uh, we just ask that you would graciously provide for them in this little dark moment and uh, that they would look to you and love your name. We pray for John that you would give him wisdom as he works out what to do with his work, uh, whether to uh, whether to cut, whether to uh, stop work or whether to carry on and all those difficult decisions. We pray that you would help him and, and lots of others like them who are suffering in different ways um, to know your good word and your promises. And uh, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, close by standing and watching the, uh, the song, My Soul Finds Rest in God Alone. Um, although Elijah wouldn't have known this exact song, uh, that in effect is what he was saying at the brook, isn't it? My soul finds rest in God in this weary place. So let's uh, stand and use this song perhaps to pray in some of the things we've learned.
Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in these dark and weary days uh, that our soul can find rest in you. We thank you that you are committed to your own name and to your people. And in this, we can take great trust, great confidence uh, as we trust in you. So we thank you for the things that you've taught us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do have a seat. And uh, the kids sound like they're ready to... <laughs> ready to come out, don't they? It's great joy to hear them, though, isn't it? Uh, interacting with each other and learning. Um, and uh, just, just a few little notices uh, which uh, are quite important. Parents, if you could please um, make your way back the, the way you came, so through this door and to pick up your kids uh, uh, from wherever you, wherever you dropped them. <laughs> and uh, if you came in the front way, then um, please leave that way too. Um, now, we want, to, we want to sort of encourage people to, to stay around a little bit and to, to chat with the people who are near you. Uh, the point of the bubble is that it is good to see other people again, and we want to uh, chat and welcome, but, uh, but uh, not for too long. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that, uh, like, like at a wedding, you know when you, you're queuing up for the buffet and you see the queue goes down, and then you think, oh, shall we go? Shall we, shall we go? Yeah. And then you all stand up and go. That's the kind of idea. So if you notice a bit of space at the, uh, at the doorways and the exits, then, uh, then you can leave at that time. But if they're rammed with people, don't join it. Um, you know, simple as that, really. So uh, that's, that's the way we're going to try to um, do this. And then, of course, the stewards will be, um, will be cleaning down. Um, by all means, the other thing we want to say is, uh, you know, you may, maybe not, may have not done it this first week, but by all means, plan to, um, to, to spend some time with brothers and sisters in your bubble after the service. Uh, so you might like to have a picnic. You know, it's a nice day today um, in the park or go for a walk in Richmond Park. Uh, or I'm sure Costa and Pret are... Are all open in town. You could go into town and get a get a coffee and sit outdoors or, or whatever you want to do. So, um, you know, before that, let's think about what we can do afterwards to, to maximise time together. Um, and even as we don't congregate around the the building. Um, to those who are watching online, I hope you've enjoyed being with us. And uh, if you are new and you'd like to know more about the church, then please do get in touch with us through the website. We'd love to help you to do that, and maybe even to welcome you here at one of the services as well. So uh, if that's you, do get in, ch in touch. I think that is it. Um, let us finish as we began uh, with, the words, with the words of God from Psalm 27. One thing I ask from the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Here's something from today. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. What a great promise for us. Amen. We're finished. All right. Thank you.